saw that last week and I just absolutely There we go. It's me. <laughs> he was working with it, though, back there. He's going to get that thing to go one way or the other. I think it's amazing that God tolerates us, isn't it? I mean, you think this is his universe. It's his, his earth. And if we truly could see it for what it is, he is very, very gracious. I, I read a passage of Scripture this morning that God is gracious even to the ungrateful. And then he turned right around and he said, so uh, it's easy to love somebody you like or somebody that loves you. And he said, why don't you love somebody that uh, won't appreciate it? There's a good paraphrase of that in Scripture about us loving one another. And he, it, it seems to be the preeminent thing of the structure of his kingdom. He has all things planned in your life, all the events and sequences that need to take place to bring forth a spiritual mind and a spiritual heart and a structure of his reality, of his kingdom and his provision for us. We're constantly walking through that. We're constantly in the midst of it and most of the time we're not aware of it unless we truly fine-tune our senses to hear and see what God is doing in our lives. We miss most of the glory, the glory that he has for us. The scripture says that we're supposed to ascribe to the Lord glory. Ascribe to him in the midst of the storm. Ascribe to him in the midst of the flood. Ascribe to him when the wind is howling and blowing. And this is in Psalms chapter 29. Ascribe to him when the enemy is threatening. Ascribe to him, O oh, you mountains. Ascribe to him. And what he's saying in there is learn to talk to him and say, Oh, thank you, God, for this situation. Now, most of us don't practice it, but there's a little passage of Scripture that most of us don't like. And that passage is uh, that we are supposed to Rejoice in all things. <laughs> you do that, right? <laughs> I do that, of course, but all the time. I never complain, right? <laughs> Jackie's laughing up here. <laughs> I, I complain often to her. She's my spleen. She often wishes she wouldn't. But once I get the complaint out of me, then... I can go to him. As a matter of fact, if you read the Psalms, David always is speaking to the Lord in there. he just been run over by somebody's uh, camel, you know, a whole herd of them. <laughs> and he's laying there all maimed. And he's, oh, God, my enemy, they just killed me. They just run over me. They just spit upon me. Oh, Lord, would you break their teeth out? <laughs> would you go get them and just chop them into the fish bait? I'm paraphrasing this for you. And then after he gets through pouring out the aggravation that's in his heart, the hurt, the wound that is there, all of us respond to that. Then uh, it's like the Lord moves close. And all of a sudden, with the Spirit of God there, the heart that is in David responds to that Spirit. And then it, all of a sudden you hear this voice, Oh, soul, why are you downcast? What are you doing down there? Get up! <laughs> Praise the living God. And then all of a sudden there's prophetic things that begin to take place of the revelation of, Oh, you are king of heaven. See, I see you on the throne. Oh, you're going to issue decrees. Why should I have ever doubted you're king of kings and lords? You made the earth. And he can see all these things. He can see all these things. He's got his spiritual tuner on and he can see these things. But when we get run over by the herd of camels or turtles or whatever it is, see, some things that hurt us are real slow. <laughs> it's the most miserable thing, being run over by a herd of turtles. You just think it'll never end. 
<laughs> and most people I meet, they are in. The, so, how's your herd of turtles coming there? <laughs> well, in some <summertime>, uh, <laughs> well, what are you doing under a turtle? You know. If circumstances aren't supposed to crush us, then how do we find the joy of life? Scripture says that we're supposed to be overjoyed with every circumstance that comes our way. When I see adversity, for the most part in my life, I think I have practiced the David theory, and that is feeling the turtles on me and then parting them and then connecting to the Lord and then beginning to praise Him for that situation. Because now I get to see Him move turtles. I get to see Him do things I would not otherwise have got to see Him do. As I grow older, I can see His hand in every step of my life. And everything that went on and Him placing the mysteries and things in my soul and adventure in my soul and and, and the wonderment of his provision. I, I, above all people, I think, on earth, got to see the wonderment of his provision as I was growing up. And I think it installed something within me that uh, I cannot shake out of me, and I don't want it to go out of me. It, is, it installed something very, very good. I know sometime uh, there was people, because we, my dad moved a lot, you know, if it was summer, it was time to move. If it was winter, it was time to move. <laughs> and then come spring, he'd get fever to move. <laughs> and bless his heart, he was a good provider. He didn't know how to do anything except get a job and provide for his family. And he was the most loving dad. This time I went to sleep every night on his arm. Him either singing me a song or telling me a story or making flashlight pictures on the ceiling. The man really spoke into my soul and really, really, really loved. Loved. He was full of love. One of the most loving men I've ever met in my life. He did have this problem that he was Irish <laughs> and a flash temper like that, and he was ignited. And when he was ignited, all this rah, come out, you know. Uh, Matter of fact, uh, even his last name, when the, all the, the, the kings and the high kings had been fighting that both the English and the Scottish, and the English and Scottish were trying to take over their country, I don't know, it's about 8th, ninth, 10th century, something like that, maybe as early as the 5th century, we've been kind of looking into that. Uh, uh, two of the earls that were there, or lords or kings that were there over some of the provinces, uh, it got so hot for them that they withdrew from England and, and escaped with their lives because they were fixing to be killed by some guy named John Chester, which had brought in a bunch of English. and they were trying, English, England was colonizing Ireland. Now keep in mind, Ireland had people in it, <laughs> but they were colonizing it. So, well, you can imagine if somebody coming in colonized in the middle of, just took a bulldozer and pushed everything out of the way and we're building a new city here right on top of you, get out of our way. That was happening in Ireland. And... Uh, Two of the kings fled. There was five kings. The other two had been subdued. That left one king uh, to fight the battle. I don't know which battle it was. I'm anxious to find that out. And that king fought and, and won that particular battle and stopped the English, stopped the Scottish, stopped, stopped them from doing what they were doing. And so they gave him a title uh, that... It was that he obstructed the enemy. He stopped the enemy. They gave him a title uh, because he, he uh, held back things for many years there in Ireland. And the, the title that they gave him in Gaelic was Odakrati. Odakrati. And guess what my dad's last name was? Odakrati. <laughs> because it was the first title bestowed on a knight and a king that had stopped the war that had gone on and pushed back the enemy. He was called the obstruction that could stop the enemy. And that's where the name Doherty came from. So my heritage was one of being an obstruction. <laughs> now, some people just call it an obstruction, but what was he obstructing? He was obstructing the evil one from coming and taking those things from the country. And... 
the reason I'm telling you this is because he also couldn't let moss grow under his feet, you know, or grass. And we would move a lot. We'd move a lot. And so I've got all these adventures that my life consists of. Adventures of living in California, and I could tell you all kinds of stories about that. Adventures of living in Texas. Adventures of living in the desert in New Mexico. Adventures of living in the desert in Arizona. Adventures of living in Utah when there was the great uranium strike. And there was some little city named Moab that had about probably 150 people in it at the time. And there was 25,000 people camped beside the road in tents, sleeping on the ground. They'd come from all over the nation to look for uranium and get rich. It was, a, it was like a, the old-fashioned gold strike. I, I'm, I must be ancient because I've witnessed a lot of these things. All along the way, I can always see God's hand because if my dad got out of a job... He would instantly sell everything we have, and whatever we had left went in the car, because you couldn't take it with us. He would pack the back seat, the floorboard, all the way up to the top of the back seat, and that was a bed for me and my brother. And if he were in Texas, he knew he could always get a job in California. He could. The man was a marvelous worker. He was a ten smith. He was a presser and cleaner. He was one of the most amazing spotters. He could take ballpoint ink out of a white Panama suit. I know what anybody could do that back then. When he'd go in and show them a formula he'd come up with and put that on there, they would lay off two people to hire him. Why? Because they, 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 he was just an amazing worker. But he would get mad about three, four, six months later and, why, I quit this job. You know, the obstruction part would come out. And except he wasn't doing it for the against the enemy. <laughs> now, in this, it made a life for me that we, we moved a lot. And so I had no roots as far as being rooted in a school, no roots in friends, no roots in my pleasure of baseball, basketball, football, uh, music, uh, no roots in the home that my mother grew up in a home. It was, I used to visit it when I was a kid, and it was like, oh my goodness, a real home that a whole family of 12 grew up in year after year. Years of memories for 12 children to grow up in the same house. and To know my mother was a little girl when she sat on the porch and played in that yard out there and picked pecans from that tree. and It just left a lot of nostalgia to visit some of my aunts and uncles and cousins that did have that lifestyle when we didn't have that lifestyle. Now, early on, I didn't know the difference. It was just a way of life so that my dad could provide sustenance for us. If a job played out in Texas, it was getting hot, which in Texas, if it got hot, the dry cleaning trade just shut down and they laid off everybody in the plant. Everybody. And so my dad, he wouldn't threaten. He would come in, well, Time to go to California. Sell everything, pack everything. And in two and a half days, we'd be in California, and he'd be working. And he would start looking for us a house. We may have had to sleep in the car for three, four, five days or a week until he could get a draw on a salary, and he'd get a house. And the next week, we'd get a little bit of furniture and, and of course, a little bit of food and, and then get the shop set back up in a full-blown house again. And it was just like, wow, it was an adventure. Now, I know. You could say, well, that poor kid. But what it did, it made my family like this. We were solid. We were solid with each other. We could depend upon each other. We knew we would always be there. We did everything for each other. There was no division within us. There was no searching after something else and replacing it with something else. And there was no giving our hearts to something else. But God was right there in the midst of that all the time. All the time. Boy, I could hear my mother mumbling in the background of, oh, Lord, I thank you so much. Thank you for this week you gave us a sack of flour, you know. Or this week we, we, we had a sack of sugar. I mean, that, it, it, you really, you can get down to the simplicity of thanking God <laughs> if you don't have much. <laughs> and it's strange. We get this overabundance and we forget to thank God. But yet when we got nothing and he gives us a little sack of flour so two little babies can eat and a mother can all of a sudden, we get gratefulness in our heart. So uh, I, I want to share with you a, uh, 
the greatness of God uh, that he has been and things he's done and some of the things that molded some of my character in him. See, because if we're thankful and we're in the circumstances, whichever one of you are in circumstances, the only person that wouldn't be in a circumstance is when it's in a pine box. <laughs> right? So that puts all of us, the rest of us, in a circumstance that we're going through something in life. And we can become embittered about it. The root of bitterness defiles many, is what the scripture says. So if we allow that bitterness to come up in us, if I don't like something, I don't like this, I don't, and we become a resistor, then uh, it, it causes a spring within us that leaches into others for bitterness of life itself. It makes life bitter. Uh, I, I one time went to Sulphur, Oklahoma, which uh, at one time had the world's smallest, or the, the smallest national park in the United States. It covered about a half a square mile, if that much, the smallest national park. It's not a national park anymore. They got embarrassed because it was so small, but it was phenomenal. There was like 57 different types of waters that burst out of the ground there. I may be getting the number wrong, but they had springs all over the place. And each spring tasted different because they came from a different locality up in the, up in the different parts of the United States where that water basin was coming down. And they had sulfur water and they had other water that tasted like iron and they had some that smelled like rotten eggs. And, and they had every kind of water you could think of there. And uh, in the midst of seeing all these things... Uh, the different waters are there. It's like our lives. There are some springs within us that we need to block up. That the enemy brought forth the bitterness. And if that water, if we can't dig that well out and get the dead animal out of that well so it can produce good water, we need to cut that water off because God needs to be our supply of good water. Now, I want to share with you some, uh, some thoughts about uh, moving along. Is Jesus returned to Galilee in power of the Spirit and news spread about him through all the surrounding districts. This is in uh, Luke chapter 4, I believe it is. Jesus returned to Galilee in power of the Spirit. Now, he had grown up as a lad and had a history behind himself, and in that history, there was character that was formed in him. He watched his dad die. He became the leader of the family, being the eldest he became a spiritual covering, being the oldest. Did you know that? People never even thought about that. Still teaching the family, because that, that passed on to the oldest in the, in the, and, and, and until teaching the family, making sure they go to the synagogue, all his brothers and sisters. Why, it was a male society back then, and a female, she, she performed a role too that was there that was very important. But these distinct things were given to, to the male to do, and that was one, the provision, and two, to make sure that the family heritage proceeds on. And uh, anyway, so Jesus had some great responsibilities that none of us ever even calculated or think about. But those helped form his character. When his dad died, now it put him in charge of the carpenter shop, him in charge to feed all the little mouths of his brothers and sisters. It put him in charge to seek God. It put him in charge to comfort his mother. It put him in charge. And if it failed, if there was a need... It was upon his shoulders. Now, most of us don't even think about how that molded his character going through those circumstances. Do you think he died? Do you think he cried at his dad's funeral? I bet he did. I bet he cried his heart out. This was a man filled with love and compassion. I bet he cried more tears than you and I have, could have ever thought of because he knew the man intimately, the deepest, because this is also God that was standing there. and He knew him in absolute perfectness. He knew him without having anything against him or any reservation in his heart. He knew him for the joys of God had made his father. So I, I know that the, the deepness that was within him that was formed as a result of that particular thing happening, causing something to happen. And now then think of the character that was developed in the responsibility areas of being responsible for the family of God being developed right there as him being young and having to make sure, okay, I'm up and I'm out, I'm, you know, and, and Sally, you need to go feed the, 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 
the chickens and Bill you need to go do the horses and you need to feed the camels and you need to uh, all the, you know they didn't have refrigerators so they still had livestock and all that was assigned out in different duties he had to see that that family was well organized and was doing its duties before he ever went to the shop and then every decision about the household he had to be making those decisions now I'm giving you these in speculation format because these are things that are mentioned in some of the, the ancient writings about him growing up as a child. When he was 12 years old, he honestly thought that he was supposed to be transferred from his mother to God the Father. Why? Because God was his father, and he knew that. And he honestly thought that he was supposed to do his father's business. Like Samuel, he, he was delivered to the temple, and he thought that's what that procession was. Wow, you wouldn't believe it. All my relatives got together, and they knew that I was had to go uh, work for my father, and I'd never see my family again, and they took me to Jerusalem in this huge caravan. Yeah, I can just hear his thoughts going in this, you know, 12-year-old boy, and he's watching and looking at the different things, and he enters the temple, and they haven't seen him, and he's gone, and they're headed back, and... And now they, they miss him, and oh my goodness, he's not here, and they head back down to Jerusalem, and you don't get in fast lane of the camel herd, you know, and get back down there and find him. And, and he, he said, didn't you know I'd be about my father's business? So he assumed his role and responsibility in every position that he was in. And when his father told him, well, no, this has grieved me and your mother. You're supposed to finish living your life. Because, see, you, you, you may have hit bar mitzvah, which meant that you entered manhood, but you're not officially a man until you start reaching about 30 back then, you know. And you, you, could, you could be a soldier and all kinds of things, but they didn't really officially think that you had much sense until you reached 30. You, you think... That be maybe a good rule. We need in our society. We need to push it on up to about fifty. Because I'm telling you, there's some eggheads out here. We've really taught them some bad things, and and not enforced what God has to say. And as a result, the mind gets warped. And as a result, it takes somebody an extra twenty years to really discover the truth about themselves and the truth about the world. I can't. I don't know how many left wing. People with their brain is full of mush and garbage that they picked up in school. And, and they're, you know, they're all for let's do anything and everything that there is and everything is okay. And then when they hit 50, they finally find out of, uh, oh, my goodness, uh, I was wrong. And they totally change their whole thought process. And now, now it's so back then they didn't have the amount of problems in that area as we do. So there's much programming that the enemy has done and poured into us that we need to get rid of in our thought process. Now, the reason I'm pouring that out there is because Jesus did not assume his role as the leader of God's house on earth until he reached 30. When he reached 30, he assumed that role. So during that period of time that he was a child, there was all the situations and circumstances and responsibilities that were placed upon him that helped mold his character. So that molding of the character and the Holy Spirit being there, he could, the Holy Spirit was now using the situation to help transform the inside for the practical workings out of spiritual things with God. So that he really assumed he was supposed to be about his father's business. He really assumed he was supposed to be preaching the good news. Matter of fact, after his return to Galilee, after he had received the Holy Spirit, after he had been tempted out in the wilderness, when he returned, he read in the book and found it in the synagogue. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor and he has sent me to proclaim the release to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind and set those who are oppressed free and proclaim this is the favorable year of the Lord. That was his mission. He described to us layer after layer of his new mission that he was commissioned on. And I would like to point out to you, we need to take it to heart that the Spirit of the Lord is upon him if we ask his Spirit to come in to us. Now the Spirit of the Lord rests in us. Now we need the Holy Spirit too. We've talked about that. But he was anointed to preach the gospel. 
And when you look at the gospel, he, just, he was preaching it in every village. The scripture says he reached every village and every person that was a Hebrew person in that nation. He went and preached in every village so that there was not one person in the entire country who had not heard the truth. Pharisees included, and boy, they were always bitter, bitter, bitter against what he had to say. I love it that he says, and he was sent to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. As long as I can remember, because of my mother's relationship with the Lord, it's like the Lord's favor was always upon us. Always upon us. I want to take you on a little side trip of uh, thought processes of one of my uh, adventures that the Lord sent me on that helped develop character within me. I was in the fifth grade, had just graduated from the fifth grade, and I always graduated early each year. And the reason I say that is because Dad, uh, he would get moss under his feet come spring. You know, well, when are the kids getting out? When are the boys getting out? You know, And usually the last two weeks of school, he would go in and check us out and get our final report cards. <laughs> Why? He's ready to go. <laughs> He's anxious to go. And in this particular trip, instead of us going straight back to Texas, he had at one time in his relationship with my mom, had been up to Farmington, New Mexico, and knew that it was a booming area because of the oil fields and all that stuff. That's right up in the northern corner, northwest corner of, uh, of, uh, of New Mexico. And that's desert down in there, but tremendous oil field in that area. Uh, anyway, he, he thought through the process that, I know, we'll go up there and we'll, uh, I'll, get, I'll get work there. And uh, when we got close to that area, we were headed across the, uh, the countryside. You can imagine, uh, you, you, most of the cars we drove were at least 10 years old, and most of them didn't have really decent tires on them. And uh, we always had a spare, but sometimes that tire would blow, and then the spare was not there because tires just didn't last the way they do today. You'd be driving along, especially in the desert, and the heat just caused them just to blow out. And as a matter of fact, there was sometimes we'd cross the desert and be 125 degrees, and Dad have to get out and let some of the air out of the tires because they start expanding and expanding because the pavement's like 150 degrees, something like that. Anyway, he was cutting across and uh, decided to go through the, the, some back roads to save maybe 400 miles. And uh, now this is back. you got to remember, I'm ancient. And when we got into the Four Corners area, it's all red dirt. you got these huge rocks formations everywhere. And the wind's blowing. And the wind's blowing probably 50 miles an hour. And you can't even see hardly the end of the hood of the car. We're in a full-blown sandstorm. And you can't see. And my dad just barely driving slow and what he's trying to do he's trying to he's made a decision i i want to uh, one of my in, one of his in-laws lived in montrose colorado and uh, he wanted to go there yeah he heard heard that it's a beautiful beautiful place he loved beautiful places and uh unbeknownst to him uh the the way he was going there was no paved roads This is a place in, up in that part of the country where uh, either uh, there, there's tons of snow, and if you've got tons of snow, you can't they use gravel roads because the gravel gives you traction when the snow keeps doing its thing. Up in Alaska, you'll find a lot of gravel roads, too, because of the, the snow. If you make them out of pavement, the pavement just freezes and buckles. and it, I mean, it's just violent to try to... Yeah, that's why most of the Alcan is, 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 is gravel. Anyway, uh, so we're catching gravel road after gravel road. I've never seen gravel road. I mean, I'm thinking that we're at the edge of the world. <laughs> that, is there any civilization out there, you know? We get on one of those high peaks and look, and there's nothing. There's just, there's just vast valleys of nothing with no cities in them. You know, when I was a kid, and... Uh, Occasionally we'd see deer and we'd see uh, elk and bears and stuff like that. <gasps> We're, um, is Davy Crockett out there somewhere? I mean, now you, I'm telling you all this because I'm I'm a young kid and I'm from going from fifth grade into sixth grade, so there's lots of thoughts in my process that I don't know how to process. 
I've been raised mostly in the South where there was just heat and sunshine. And now we're moving up, and I can see these huge, jagged mountains. You can imagine in May, they're still covered with snow in Colorado. There's 14,000 foot mountains there. They're still covered with snow. And I'm thinking, wow, snow. I've never, never been in that. And then you get out, and you're freezing to death. It's ice cold, different environment. The roads aren't paved. There's no stop signs. There's no traffic lights. There's no electricity out in the middle of nowhere. And I remember driving and driving and driving and my dad coming to one place and it was a little store out in the middle of nowhere. It's probably 100 miles from nothing. And I think, well, why is there a store out here? And my dad had kind of lost his way because the area we were going through, the maps weren't real clear about. And so he stopped to get some directions. Now, keep in mind, what's God doing with my character? I'm hearing, he doesn't know the way, I'm hearing, we're in the middle of nowhere, I'm hearing, wonder why all the roads are just dirt around here. I'm a 12-year-old kid. Now, I don't see my dad necessarily get antsy about it. it. It threw some antennas up on his part and on my mom's part. And so I'm back there praying. I said, Lord, this is scary. We're at the edge of the earth. <laughs> there's no civilization out here. It's strange feeling that there's no civilization. There's a lot of security when there's cities. There's a lot of security to know that there's a store where you can get a soda pop or where there's really other people. But when you haven't seen houses for 100 miles and, and there's nothing there inside me, I'm having to turn to the Lord because I'm in the edge of nothingness in my mind. And then my dad decides to catch the logging road over those mountains to save another three, four hundred miles to get to. Now, logging roads are fine if you can gear down, but most of the cars we had were three speeds, and that was something he didn't know about because you got to brake all the way down instead of downshifting, and low gear usually won't get you unless you, you know. Now, I'm, I'm telling you this because it was quite a hairy experience just getting to Montrose. And in that hairy experience, I've got two choices. I can, I can begin to become unsettled in my soul, frightful, fearful of thinking, oh my goodness. It could have, I could have let the enemy speak to me and put in me an untrust for the decisions that my parents make, right? It was exactly the opposite. Instead, now since we're in the middle of the great wilderness that must cover from here to Russia. <laughs> it makes me all the more tied to their judgments and now praying for their judgments. As a young boy of 12, of praying, Oh Lord, would you see us off the top of this mountain? Smoke coming off the wheels, the brakes. Would you see us off the top of this mountain? Now, if you're coming down off a 14,000-foot mountain, when you go up to Mount Shushkin, that's only 6,000 feet where you're looking at Baker. Uh, these passes we were going over were 12,000 feet or better, and you had another 2,000 feet of mountains that go up. And the little switchback curves on those mountain roads. So can you see in that circumstances, God is molding my character. I've got two choices. And it always comes to two choices in everything that we face. Am I going to call out for him, for his help, and believe him in the midst of the circumstances that he will deliver us into safety, that he will deliver us and pro provide for us? Because we've got nothing. I always knew the amount of money we had, and whenever Dad moved, it was always with $50 or 25 bucks from Texas to California. And granted, gas was 15 cents a gallon or 25 cents a gallon, but even so, to go on a 2,000-mile trip with $25 in your pocket, that takes a great amount of faith, does it not? Now, my dad was not a great man of faith, but he was a man that just absolutely... No, we can make it. He was an optimist in many areas and pessimist in other areas. But that particular area, he was an optimist. We'll get there. We can get there. We can get there. And so I watched this as every impossible situation. And I, I remember when we went through Utah, there was a, a rod that went through the block of the car. A rod. 
went through the block of the car. And my dad, wow, this is bad. <laughs> and it's pretty bad if you've got to ride through the block of the car. And he gets out and he takes the pan off and drains the oil and tells my mom, save the oil. <laughs> and he gets that cylinder hold of it and uh, he drives that thing all the way up into the top so it can't move and takes the bearing off of it and gets it out of the way of the crankshaft. And then he comes in and he, what do we got? Newspaper and then, I don't know all this stuff. And he crammed it in the engine block and the top section uh, so full the oil couldn't come out, and then he dumped the oil back in it and buttoned the pan back up on it. And that car ran for another 700 miles. Now, you can imagine me as a little child seeing those kind of things happen, the confidence that it was building within me of, oh God, you can always get us out of any circumstance that there is, and then always when we come out of that circumstance, there's always your amazing great provision. Your amazing great provision. That's exactly what it was to me. Whenever we moved, it was the thrill of having nothing and getting there on this great hairy journey, because sometimes those would take us two weeks because of motor difficulties, financial difficulties, having to eat potato chip sandwiches, having to sometimes eat nothing. And, you know, it was just absolutely gloriously amazing. It was the truest adventure. Uh, you know, I hear about guys saying, oh, well, we can be dropped out of an airplane with a parachute and a knife and survive. I was in survival school where my soul would, would survive with joy. It would just survive with joy. Why? Because I would always get to see God move. He was always in the back of my mind. I could always see my mom praying. I said, oh, Lord. Yeah, my dad get out and go in, and he's looking for a tire or something like that and said, Lord, you are our provider. I'm in your hands. My children are in your hands. Say, I'd listen. I'd listen. And those things were going into my heart. And I would be crying out to my Lord too. And before the journey and trip was over, when we finally entered into Montrose, my aunt and uncle were there. And they greeted us with joy. And they had this beautiful trailer house that was like a castle to me. And uh, they, they made a pallets for us and fed us and all that stuff. And to feel that warm enduring and having a grand meal and all that stuff after a hairy adventure that had maybe been going on for two weeks of the impossibilities of no provisions in life and no answers. And always the absolute end was there. <laughs> always those things were implied by the enemy but yet God always brought us through in the midst of that now when we got down to Montrose Montrose was an interesting place and I, I want to I don't know uh, paint maybe this for you of what took place there uh, I got to see what it's like to be in a community that's really close, that's cut off from the outside world. It's cut off. And the reason I say it's cut off is down in a bowl, and you look up and there's these 14,000 foot mountains all the way around you. And you think, oh my goodness. And you're down in this beautiful, lush form valley. It's kind of deserty, but yet in the spring everything's green, and of course they raise potatoes there and uh, all kind of alfalfa and sheep and cattle and they have orchards peach orchards and cherry orchards and plum orchards and every kind of fruit that you can think of and keep in mind i've been down in the desert most of my life and i've not seen that much fruitfulness water running everywhere beside every road there's ditches full of water from the irrigation systems that they had in that area. All the fields full of water. because and, and so I've been used to the desert. And here I'm in the high mountains and there's water everywhere and greenery everywhere. And you talk about feeling the day of the Lord's favor. I felt like I'd been dropped into heaven because I'd always been hovering down in the desert where the greenery is not there. And the majestic mountains aren't there. And the cool breezes in the hot, hot summertime. I'd never experienced that. And my soul began to respond that way to the Lord. Inside at 12 years old, I'm, oh, Lord, this is magnificent. I really could connect the mountains to him. 
I would look at the different high peaks that were up there and say, Are you on that one, Lord? Or, or are you on that one? Which one are you on? So in my adventures of these things, it was calling to me of how God is our provider. When we got down, not only did we stay there, Dad went into town and he got a job, and a week later, uh, man, he rented this house in town, and it was absolutely like heaven. It, it had wooden molding in it. It was a beautiful house, and it was furnished. And then some people came by from the Gunnison River that he had met, and, and they said, uh, you know, hey, we've been fishing, and we caught too many fish. Don't know what to do with these others. And, and, and they dropped off about 15 trout that were, I'm going to say, two and a half to five-pound trout. And I'm going, oh, wow, those are on the river here? <laughs> it was a fruitful, fruitful place. I got to see the cherries come off, and I remember my brother and mother going and trying to pick cherries, and that didn't work out too good. I remember finally Dad rented a house out in the country. It was on a farm, and we moved from a city, which I really love that city still to this day. I really love that city. Most magnificent park, really tight-knit families. Uh, no fly-by-night people there. This is this was in the middle of nowhere. They've got a bunch of fly-by-nights now because all the artsy people move there. But back then, it was just a hidden farm community in the middle of the mountains, in the middle of nowhere. And so it really made either there were good families or the bad families, and the bad families evidently were driven out because I didn't meet any. <laughs> Society pretty much cleaned itself back then and, and had the capability of doing doing such. And we moved out in the country, and uh, Dad rented a farmhouse out there, and a, a sheep rancher. He had a thousand head of sheep, and we were right in the middle of his sheeping facilities. And so the uh, next thing I got was character in the way sheep are cared for, character in the way of how God tends his flock, character in seeing the hazards that the sheep go through, the needs that they have. And then the preparation I got involved in, uh, the preparation of, uh, uh, I, I was probably 140 pounds, 135 pounds when I was fixing to enter the sixth grade, uh, pretty stout. And so I bucked hay that summer, uh, these huge haystacks, alfalfa, made silage, got stuck in this big truck, the, uh, Mr. Cook, which was the guy that owned the place we lived on. Hey, can you drive? Uh, well, um... No. <laughs> you know, you want to say, yes, so bad, yes, you know. And uh, Dad had sent something on let us behind a wheel. And, uh, he, well, can you steer? Just, just, he said, what I want you to do, you get up in this big truck. And it's one of those huge silage trucks. I mean, it's a huge dump truck with, uh, you know, the big double axles in the back and all that stuff. And it's full of silage. And he said, well, I want you to just hold that steering wheel. I'll get it started and I'll put it in gear and then I'll jump up. And, then, and man, I don't know anything about this truck. It's got two gear to gear shifts, and I, I'm supposed to drive it for probably four miles. And you talk about frightened to death and white knuckles, and there's a fence over there, and there's a fence over there. <laughs> I made it to the end, and I gained a little confidence that, okay, Lord, it is possible, because I couldn't reach the clutch or the pedal, pedals uh, and, and do all the stuff uh, I guess I could reach them, but I just I didn't know how to do all that stuff. I learned. I learned. Well, my point is, in being in those different situations, they're frightful situations. Each one of those situations are, but they're developing character within me, and that God can put me in an uncomfortable position and can deliver me in that uncomfortable position to produce some character in me that I'm going to use later on. Now, what that produced in me and the other things produced in me is that if the Lord speaks to me, he says, do that. It may look impossible. That doesn't matter. It may look like it's undoable. That doesn't matter either. If God said, do it, then I'm supposed to do that. It placed within me a character that I'm just supposed to act and things will carry through so that the final outcome will be the final outcome that God had for the final outcome. Jesus in his walk with his father that's what he did every day that's what he did every day he got up and he sought the father and he did what the father wanted that day and he was not fretful about the provision he was not fretful about 
his mothers and father, or not father, but his mothers and brothers and sisters. And even one time when they come to visit, and he has maybe four or five hundred people pressed in around him, and the power of God's coming in, and people are being healed. Lepers waiting in line, no doubt. People with no eyeballs waiting in line. There was some serious business of God that was being conducted there. And somebody comes in, hey, our mothers and brothers and sisters are out here. Why don't you shut down that business of God and just go out there and relax and visit? And he no, i tell you who my brothers and mothers and sisters are. It's this family that you see. It's whoever does the will of God. That now is the family. That's my mother, brothers, and sisters. He was on bead because he had developed the character. And God put him in those circumstances and those situations to develop a stalwart character that he would stay on bead and do the work of the Father. That's why he was always making this statement. I have come to do his will. It is written about me in the scrolls that I have come to do his will. Do you realize he's the first man on earth? earth that totally came to do his will since Adam before Adam fell his total purpose in life was to do God's will in the garden was it not and now here is Jesus and Jesus is here to do his father's will and he carries it out magnificently because of the circumstances he had been put in he too had moved a little bit when he was a kid didn't he, he escaped down to Egypt Ran from the king, went and hid in one city, went back to pay taxes in another, and then had to disappear from that one, and then finally ended up in no man's land up there in uh, Galilee somewhere. And I said, who is this guy? Who is this guy? He was able to do magnificent things in God. Magnificent things. Why? Because God already developed within him true spiritual character through the situations and circumstances that he's in. I could go on and on about the story of there in Montrose of God giving us provisions of fruit when the fruit came off that, my goodness, we had cans and cans and cans of peaches, I mean, you know, the jars, and apricots and plums and tomatoes and every type of fruit that there was, it was just given to us because there was such an excess there that, here, this is getting a bit overripe. And, oh, here, here's, uh, we've got an extra thousand pounds of potatoes and, you know, that wouldn't fit on that last truck. And here, y'all put these in your cellar. God's amazing provision. I saw that hundreds of times of him enabling us to start over in a new society, in a new place. And this was totally foreign to me. We got white stuff on the ground. What do you do with that? <laughs> I was a desert rat. <laughs> you ever get any snow down in Bisbee? <laughs> Not very often. <laughs> it was a new environment and a new way of life. And whenever we get in those circumstances, we're supposed to rejoice in the Lord in all things. And let him work in our character the things of the difficulties that we meet that teach us forbearance, that teach us patience. Uh, those things are precious, precious to the Lord. Most of us don't want to forbear anything. The selfish part of us just instantly, give me this or I'm going to go off on you. And when something goes off on you, it, it is, it's, it's heartbreaking. When something goes off inside of us, it's heartbreaking. I share one other little incident that took place there. Uh, my brother and I were extremely close, extremely close. And I saw him kind of have a meltdown when we were in school. We were both in the sixth grade. He had failed the grade, so we were both in the same classroom. And the, cl the school we went to, my goodness, it was a little three-room three -room schoolhouse. Jackie and I visited the last time we went up there. Beautiful little schoolhouse, three rooms, auditorium, cafeteria. And uh, I started getting knit with some of the kids there. The first time in my life I'd ever started getting knit with some of the kids there. One of the farm kids down the road. I started getting knit there. And the teacher told my brother to do something one day, and he was resisting. He, he, bless his heart, he, he was resistive that day. I don't know what else was in his head or in his heart. He's a young kid like me. And the teacher didn't like what he said or what he did, and so she scolded him. He didn't like that even more. And when my brother got mad, he just kind of lost his marbles, you know. 
he finally got mad enough that she, he wouldn't listen to her at all, and so she said, well, come here, you're going to stand against the wall. And when she was walking over, standing, and she was poking him in the back, come on, go on, go on, because he had... It's my brother that I loved. It's my brother that's my dearest companion. I'd started getting some other companions that were in the room, but this is my brother. That I'm, and I see him being resistant. I see him being rebellious. I see him. I'm embarrassed. I got my head down. I think, oh, come on, Phil. Just, oh, just, just go over. Oh, Lord, help him. Help him submit. Help him go over and just, just put his face against the wall. Help him stop this so it doesn't go on any further. And I, I was almost in tears. I had my head ducked down between my arms because it was embarrassing to me to see this resistance. I mean, she poked him about the sixth time. He blew up. He turned around took a swing at her with his fist. I'm, I'm talking about the most ungodly action I've ever seen some young man do to a teacher. And, and I'm, now I'm in shock. Oh, everybody sees it. I feel the pain of our family's name is now dirt. Our family's name in this community is that we're rabble rousers and that we are instantly that. All that went through my head. But at the same time, I could see my brother struggling. Something's going on in him. And he's hurt and he's angry and he's standing there crying and he's ready to fight. And I go over and I just I put my arms around him. I just began to weep. And I said, come on, Phil, come on. Let's, let's go out here. You know, and took him outside. I was weeping for his action. I was weeping for what he did. He injured himself, but he's injured inside. I know he's injured inside. Yes, it was a reaction that was wrong on the outside, but now my brother's injured himself inside. I don't know how I can recover from it. I can't go apologize for him. That really has no bearing on it. I must be his friend. I must be close to him. I must love him and draw him out of himself and draw him out of this, whatever is going on on the inside. And I spent the next two hours in isolation. And of course, there was a school hearing, and uh, it was like coming up before the parole board. <laughs> Within me, it... Uh, was one of the deepest hurts I've ever experienced in my life because it was shame. But then on the other hand, here's my dearest brother. How do I help him pass that so he doesn't have that failure again in the future? He's what counts, is it not? He's my family. He's what counts. Jesus is like that to us. There's many times that we've been impossible. We've shamed him. And we've done that, which we shouldn't. If I not, had I not had that experience, there's many times I would give up in ministry just because of the impossibilities of some of the things I face and some of the remarks. Not, that's just the nature of being a shepherd. Is sheep get dirty and sheep need washing and sheep bite. Had I not been there and experienced that and loved my brother so much that I wanted to help him out of that, I could not have. I would have, I would have, man, that, that was bad news. I, I don't, my brother, I'm with you guys. Would that have helped him? If I would have been with him in any way, shape, or form, what he did was wrong, and I certainly wasn't trying to make it right in their eyes. What he did was horrifying and shock value. I couldn't live past that. I couldn't connect to them anymore. It breached all the relationships that I had. It breached. I had worked really hard to have a deep relationship with that teacher. That summer I'd gone to visit her. My mother took me to visit her ahead of time to get to know her. And I wanted to be so pleasing to that teacher. And now... There's no way I could. I've got all that internal damage going on inside me. It's a hard situation. It's a hard circumstance. Day after day to see kids that you know that are looking cross-eyed at you and staring and wondering 
well, what's going to happen next? What kind of family are you in our midst? My whole attention was turned towards my brother and how I could help him. Not trying to improve or change that, I couldn't. But my whole point in laying this out before you, it was a, it was a hard, bitter experience for me, and I'm sure it was for my mom and dad. I remember them weeping and crying as the board of the school board members came out to visit them about the situation. It put within me a character that I'm supposed to love and help my brother through hard times when they do things they shouldn't do, when they injure themselves so deeply that uh, it's embarrassing. Do you see how that incident put some character within me where I had to make some decisions early on in my life when I didn't have the emotional capability of dealing with things like that. It still affects me. But on the other hand, I couldn't abandon my brother and would not and could not think. All I could see is his brokenness, his anger, his hostility, and trying to get him out of that mindset, trying to bring him back into reality because I had a whole life to live with him, right? He was dear to me. I must rescue my brother and get him back to the brother I know. Although it was a very hard situation for me, we moved not long after that, and that's great relief. Great relief. It built some character within me. That's why the Lord makes the statement, Rejoice whenever you find yourself in these situations. <laughs> Rejoice in all things. Do you trust him that your character is, he's trying to mold that character to be like his? Because when he comes, what's going to be important is the character of him that we have within us. How much we were able to set ourselves aside and do his will. How much we were able to cast our own selfish ways down and say no. And think of the other person. Many times we're, we're put in this situation until we can become like this. God couldn't put us in any other situation except to allow the, that to happen until finally that would take place. Wearing down something inside of us that's resistive to Him. So every circumstance that you're in, begin to pray and say, Lord, first I thank you, and second, would you please, please produce your character within me? The long-suffering is like precious gold to him. And us having peace when there's turmoil and peace in the circumstances, that's precious to him. Jesus did not get upset. Even when they were trying to crucify him, he did not get upset. Even when they're speed, spitting upon him. And he was not cold-hearted. He just was interested in doing the Father's will. And he had developed, through the circumstances of life, he had developed, and the Holy Spirit being there, he had developed the characteristics that he would need to endure those things. Jesus is wanting to give you more of his character. The problem is, as we look at this, as this is the final stage of life. <coughs> Uh, it, it is not the final stage of life. And after the to be attitudes, he starts talking, and I think that is, uh, what, chapter 6 or something like that? No. Jesus chooses his 12, and then he brings them in chapter 20 of verse 7, I think it is. And we've done the to be attitudes. There's a teaching on that. Most of you have that. And, but after that, he's preaching the gospel. And he says, but woe to you rich, for you have received all the comfort you'll ever get in full payment. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be starved and you will be hungry. Woe to you who laugh right now, for you shall mourn and you shall weep. Woe to you when men speak well of you. For their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same manner and in the same way. But I say to you here, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. 
whoever hits you on the cheek. And he goes on and on and on. He's giving the gospel. And something that jumps out at me, me is every one of the things that's listed there that he's saying woe to is our pursuit of what we want in this life for our happiness. And then if that is our total heart, then if we don't get that, what we want, then we have some form of reaction I was with a lady earlier this week, and she's not of this body, and she had uh, asked me to give her some truth about a situation, and I gave her part of the truth the week before, and she was receptive of that. And then when I gave her the second part of the truth this week, as soon as she heard the truth that she couldn't have what she wanted because she had convinced herself I can hear God. I know what his will is for my life. As soon as she heard that wasn't God's will, what is it with men of God? Oh, they always give me a pain. They are such a pain in my life. They always tell me no. I'm serious. <laughs> I'm, hmm. Lord, what do I do with this? And then she kept going on. And she went on about her first marriage. And then she got more angry and more angry. And now all of a sudden the anger was turned fully towards the Lord. What is it with you up there? Why did you let me marry that man 20 years ago when I could solidly hear you? My hearing is so good. Why didn't you tell me he was an ornery cuss? Why didn't you tell me? What kind of God are you? Truth comes to the surface. Uh, spring of bitterness in the well and all that. And I, I'm sitting there, well, Lord, what do I do with this pancake? It's stuck on the roof. <laughs> you know, they flipped it. <laughs> and I went, well, ma'am, don't know about all those things. I do know this. If you're hearing, if you could hear, if you could, if you could have heard God, then you would have heard Him say, "Don't do things your own way." And the Scripture says, "We reap what we sow," and your whole life is a life of destruction because of the seeds that you've sown. No one else could sow those seeds for you. Your ex didn't. The scripture says you've sown those seeds, and now you're telling me. You hear from God when you couldn't hear from him back then. How much evidence does it take you to believe? I'm not going to give you the rest. It turned out fairly well. My point in giving you that is God wants us to follow him. Our Lord Jesus wants us to follow him. And we've got two things we can do. One, me, myself, and I, and the comfort of surrounding ourselves. And Jesus makes the statement, woe to you if you well fed now, because you're going to starve to death then. Woe to you if you rich now, because you're not going to have nothing then. This is eternity we're talking about, and it's a real city, and it's a real society, it's real beings, it's your real father. It's eternity, and this is just very, very short of us living here. Start working with God. Let Him work upon your character. And let Him put something within you you do not have. He's willing to do that. He's willing to abide with us. He's willing to love us through our hostility. He's willing to love us through our angers, our hurts, and our wounds. He's willing. question is, are you willing? He knows your heart. He knows the amount of failures that you've had. He's not looking to your past failures. He's looking to your future and saying, Will you be willing with me? Will you let me help develop these things within you that you need? Let's bow our hearts before him and pray. Lord, I uh, am humbled before you. Some of the memories I have still hurt, but also still reinforce of how to love your family and how to love your people into your presence. Some of the things that happened caused an earnest love within me for my brother in Christ. And I don't want to let go. I don't want to see him perish. Help us have that kind of love for each other and a deeper and greater love for you. In Jesus' great and powerful and precious name I pray. 
Amen. 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 God richly bless you. If anybody needs prayer, I'd be glad to lay hands on you and pray for you. The rest of you are dismissed. And if you want a fellowship back there in the back while we do the prayer thing, that would be great.